So Chris, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you, Ani? Good, good, wonderful. Thank you for joining. We really appreciate your participation and the Vaccine Center's participation and support. Thank you, Ani. Uh, I'd like to introduce Nadine, Dr. Nadine Raphael. She's a professor of medicine at the Emory University, and she's the acting director of the Hope Clinic at the Emory Vaccine Center. And she's been really uh, instrumental in some of the phase one and two and three clinical trials uh, with the Moderna vaccine and uh, others, I do believe. Uh, invitation and the opportunity to talk today about something I'm quite passionate about, which is uh, vaccine uh, research. Um, um, <clears throat> so I am an infectious uh, disease physician by training. I do a lot of uh, infectious disease research, particularly relevant to vaccine. Uh, I work with a team of scientists and staff here at the Hope Clinic. That's the clinical arm of the Emory Vaccine Center. And our mission is to address global public health threats by translating basic research discoveries into clinical advances. And this is achieved by partnering with the community through education, engagement, and participation, uh, training the next generation of vaccinologists, and also conducting translation uh, human immunology studies with Dr. Rafi Ahmad and then others at the Emory Vaccine Center, and then performing clinical trials of vaccines and, and treatment. Uh, we are supported by many federal and state agencies, uh, mostly through NIH grants and contracts. And this uh, brings me to my conflict of interest. Uh, I do receive uh, funds from the following manufacturer to conduct research studies at Emory. I serve as the whole clinic uh, principal investigator for the Moderna SARS-CoV-2 phase one and phase three vaccine trials. And I also serve as the international co-chair for the Sanofi Pasteur SARS-CoV-2 phase three vaccine trial. I'm also on the advisory board for the One Day Sooner, a nonprofit organization that had signed up uh, uh, thousands of volunteers willing to participate in a human um, challenge. So COVID-19 is caused by SARS-CoV-2 and had affected uh, 44 million and took the lives of more than a million of us. SARS-CoV-2 is a relative of SARS-CoV-1 and is one of seven known coronavirus that can infect humans. So the classic triad is fever, cough, and shortness of breath. The virus can be transmitted even in the absence of symptoms. So COVID-19 has a very unpredictable pattern. So the majority of patients are asymptomatic or have mild disease. 20% still experience severe to critical illness leading to death. Now more to the immunology one-on-one. -on -one. So the virus uses its surface spike protein and the receptor binding domain to lock into ACE2 receptors on the surface of the human cell. Once inside the human cells, the virus actually use the human uh, machinery to be able to produce the virus RNA. Uh, specialized antigen presenting cells engulf the virus and display portion of it to uh, get the attention of uh, T cells called T cell helpers. Those uh, cells uh, actually uh, allows the B cells to make antibody and that eventually will block the virus from infecting cells, as well as marking the virus for destruction. Uh, that destruction is done by many types of cells, particularly the cytotoxic T cells, uh, that can identify and destroy the virus even without them being marked by the antibody. Long-lived uh, memory B and T cells that recognize the virus can patrol in the body for months or years, providing long-lasting immunity. So this is what the ideal vaccine candidate should be. It's one that can trigger both the immune response similar to one that's seen in natural infection. So what have we learned so far from natural immunity of COVID-19 from challenge models or other coronaviruses to help with the design of safe and effective vaccine? The first question is, what is the desired element in a vaccine immune response? So scientists will tell you that generation of neutralizing antibody is needed for protection. Neutralizing antibody are typically detected in the second week after symptom onset. However, in natural infection, the neutralizing antibody titers are highly variable. So what we know is that patients with severe disease tend to have higher levels than patients with mild disease. And typically vaccine trials are including serologic titers of convalescent patients as control uh, for uh, vaccines. So, and there is a huge variation on how those controls are being chosen. And this is a really um, a, a nice figure from uh, Mehu's and uh, Yen's uh, 
uh, paper that shows a correlation between the neutralizing antibody titer and the ELISA titer that will make it much more efficient to be able to screen the hundreds of vaccine candidates that's out there. Because currently, if we're going to use neutralizing antibody um, as the gold standard for evaluating the immunogenicity of vaccine candidates, this is labor intensive, this is time consuming, and it does require a high containment lab. So it's very important to discover other assays that could be done uh, quicker and uh, uh, less uh, contingent um, uh, criteria for, uh, for the execution of the test. The next question is the vaccine induced protection solely mediated by antibodies. Well, that's not exactly what I said in the slide before. So natural immunity leads to CD4, mostly TH1 response, as well as CD8 response. So what we know so far is baseline cross-reactive T cells modulates the severity of COVID-19. So an ideal vaccine should generate neutralizing antibody in addition to stimulating the cellular mediated immunity. Next question is, what part of the virus should the vaccine candidate target? And most of them are actually focusing on the immune dominant spike protein and the receptor binding domain. However, we know that CD4 and CD8 actually can see other parts of the, of the virus. Um, but again, probably the most important target should be the spike. Does the virus mutate? So since the virus is a single stranded RNA, it has the potential for many mutations. And currently, there are multiple mutations, but then one that uh, appeared relatively early on in the outbreak is the G614 polymorphism in the spike that had rapidly spread and had become um, a, a predominant form of the virus. However, this mutation does not reduce the neutralization sensitivity of the convalescent sera, and hopefully, it does not reduce the neutralization activity of the vaccine candidate. How long does the immune response last? We really don't have a answer to this critical question because of the recency of the infection. However, experience from a six-year follow-up study of SARS-CoV-1 recovered individual has shown that long-lasting T-cell response are there, even when the uh, antibody uh, responses are no longer detectable. There is currently no coronavirus vaccine. However, what we have learned from prior SARS-CoV-1 or MERS phase one vaccine trial is that the neutralizing antibody, as you can see them here, uh, they're actually weighing over time. Uh, but there is uh, also what we know so far is there are some uh, reports of COVID-19 reinfection. And that makes sense if indeed the antibody levels uh, weight over time. Um, next question is, is, is there a concern for potential for vaccine-associated enhanced respiratory disease? So this was first noted 60 years ago in young children with a formalin inactivated respiratory uh, syncytial virus vaccine, an animal model that suggested that this entity is there and probably because it's due of the fact that we make the vaccine, the, the fact that we add uh, formalin to inactivate the vaccine, uh, we lose the um, correct confirmation of the epitope and that actually results in a poor neutralization activity, and also a TH2 instead of a TH1 response. We've seen this also in SARS-CoV-1 challenge studies in animals. However, we have not seen that in SARS-CoV-2 challenge studies. Uh, but again, everybody's looking very carefully about this signal uh, to ensure the safety of the vaccines. The goal is to induce high neutralizing antibodies to generate a response that more TH1 based uh, in CD4 as well as CD8, and that uh, will uh, hopefully uh, decrease the risk of vaccine-associated enhanced respiratory disease. Uh, so, so far we have not seen that evidence, but again, later on when I show you most of the phase one and phase two result, you'll understand why it's important to focus on the neutralizing antibody, the TH1, TH2, not only from an immunogenicity perspective, but also from a safety perspective. The biggest question that the field has is what is the correlate of protection? So to be able to answer this question, efficacy trials are needed. Or we can do challenge studies where humans are deliberately exposed to the virus, though uh, many studies where human, uh, uh, so many studies are actually uh, underway, but there is no phase three uh, trial that had resulted yet. And there is currently some effort to conduct a controller human challenge model uh, but again, we're not there yet. So what we can learn is from the prior uh, endemic human coronavirus human challenges that were done 
in the UKs in the 80s. And basically the bottom line is antibody levels increase after the challenge, but then go back to pre-challenge levels. And then um, a year later, those same volunteers were re-challenged and there was protection against the same strain, but not against a different type of strain. So that suggests that the antibody response is not lasting, but the cellular one could be, and cross-protection might be problematic uh, and that is yet to be determined with the SARS-CoV-2. The last question I have is, what do we know from SARS-CoV-2 non-human challenge models? So here, the re-challenge was actually done only four weeks later. So that doesn't tell you how long the protection will be over, over, many, uh, over many months. Uh, and then, and, you know, as you can see, there was a good uh, protection, especially in the lower respiratory tract perhaps not as well in the upper respiratory tract. So that could uh, imply that the protection from the vaccines is not sterilizing. So it doesn't uh, actually get rid of the SARS-CoV-2 that could be present in, in our nose. Um, so while you know, natural infection, challenge studies, prior experience with other coronavirus vaccine are very important, really the only way we can find out how those vaccine candidates work is to actually test them and actually test them on the population that will need them the most. So that's the elderly and those with comorbidities. So how about uh, testing? Where are we now? So we actually have uh, around 48 vaccines in clinical trials in humans and close to another 90 that are under investigation in animals. We have different phases of clinical vaccine trial that are seen here. So basically in phase one, the scientists give the uh, vaccine to a small number of people to test the safety and the dosage, and then actually to confirm that the vaccine stimulated the immune response. In phase two, the vaccine is given to hundreds of people to further test the safety and ability to stimulate the immune response. In phase three, we give the vaccine to thousands of people and wait to see how many become infected, and then we compare those infection in the volunteer who had received the placebo versus those who had received the vaccine. Uh, the phase three trials are large enough to reveal evidence of relatively rare side effects that might be missed in earlier trials. And then we also have guidance from FDA about what is the acceptable level, at least to apply for approval or emergency use uh, authorization. Um, what we know is there have been an early or limited approval in China, Russia, and the Emirates for certain vaccines without waiting for a phase three trial. That could be quite risky. So again, the best way to find out is to do the phase three trial. I don't have any uh, result on any phase three trial. I, they have not uh, uh, resulted yet. Only one phase three trial we know had completed enrollment. The, the others are, are still in the process. But I will guide you through the process of the different platforms of uh, vaccine candidates. And what do we know so far from phase one and phase three trial? So the first, a platform I will show is the nucleic acid vaccine. So RNA and DNA based vaccine are safe and easy to develop. Well, all you need is just to make the genetic material and not the whole virus. And then the nucleic acid is inserted into the human cells, which then makes copy of the virus protein, most commonly the spike protein. And the platform is unproven and there is no licensed vaccine that uses this technology. So Moderna NIH collaboration led to a mRNA vaccine candidate in just two months from the discovery to testing in humans. It's an absolute astonishing speed of development. So Pfizer Permanente in Seattle was one of the sites, and Emily was asked to provide backup for Seattle on March 12th. We obtained biosafety approval the same day and single IRB approval and activation just a week later. And then we began screening 48 hours later, and the first dose of the vaccine was given in March 27th. So really, we're talking in the same semester that the virus was discovered. Um, and basically, in this, uh, in this uh, study, uh, we had, uh, we had uh, mostly uh, actually uh, uh, white uh, non-Hispanic. There were three doses that were tested, the 25 microgram, the 100 microgram, the 250 micrograms. And the doses were separated by one month. We looked at the ELISA. Uh, we also looked at the neutralizing antibody, the TH1 versus TH2 response. And as you can see, it's, it's, a, it's a great vaccine in the sense it does stimulate the TH1 response. The neutralizing antibody were high. The ELISA were remarkably high. And there was a nice correlation between the ELISA and the 
uh, live uh, virus uh, acid. We've seen uh, some uh, fatigue, chills, headaches, myalgia, and pain at the injection site. And the group that had received 250 micrograms had three severe adverse events. And because the group were rather comparable um, as far as the ELISA title, uh, the company had elected to choose the 100 micrograms to move forward in the phase three trial that just completed enrollment last Friday. They have enrolled 30,000 subjects with 20% um, uh, Hispanic and 10% African-American. Um, so that was a huge uh, accomplishment. And Emory had uh, three sites at Grady, at the Hope Clinic, and the Emory Children's Center. What's also encouraging about this phase one trial that we conducted at, at Emory is the fact that it included subjects that are older, 56 to 70 or 71 and above. And here is just the data that we had published in the England Journal of Medicine as just last month that had shown that actually um, there was a great response, almost similar to the one seen in younger adults and very much comparable to the convalescent uh, class. Uh, and it's really important to understand that this is a population that is in need of the vaccine. So to have results that do not show early immune senescence is uh, pretty remarkable. I think the next step is, will this vaccine work in people that have chronic disease, let's say diabetes, hypertension, obesity, uh, or are more frail than the relatively healthy people that we typically include in a phase one trial? Another mRNA vaccine that's almost completing that phase three trial, that the plan is to enroll 43,000 subjects, is this collaboration between a German company, BioNTech, uh, uh, Pfizer, and the Chinese drug maker, uh, uh, Hozon Pharma, to develop this uh, similar, uh, slightly different vaccine, though it uses the mRNA technology. Um, so what they did is they actually also uh, used uh, three different uh, doses the boost was done three weeks uh, later. You can also see the neutralization um, levels, the ELISA, they look maybe less, numerically less than the other one that you've seen. But again, people use different assay and it's extremely difficult to do a comparison between the, the vaccine just because the assays are not standardized, uh, nor the controls, which are the convalescent. So eventually this 30 microgram uh, those were chosen for the phase three efficacy trial, which is again currently uh, underway. They also had a group that was 65 to 85 years of age, and they actually were able to prove again with this other mRNA vaccine that the response was good in the geriatric population. And then uh, in addition to the US, they're doing the phase three trial in Argentina, Brazil, and uh, Germany. Um, so I also want to mention that there are many other efforts that are related to this uh, uh, platform from Germany, from the UK, US, uh, China, Japan, Thailand, Korea, and of course, India. So now to a different type of platform, that this is the, the, the viral vector vaccine. Uh, a, a virus such as measles or adenovirus is uh, genetically engineered so it can produce the coronavirus protein in the body. So these viruses are weakened, so they cannot really cause the disease. And there are two types those that replicate within the cells and those that cannot because they lack the genes that have been disabled. So the viral vector vaccines are believed to induce a good T cell response, which is important in addition to the neutralizing antibody. Um, the replicating viral vector, so that's uh, the typical example, is the uh, approved Ebola vaccine from 10 months ago. It's, it's a vaccine that works very well. Non-replicating viral vectors such as adenovirus, so there is no licensed vaccine that's using this method, but they have a long history in gene therapy. Uh, booster shots are needed to induce long-lasting immunity, and high nodes are needed because each non-replicating vector can only infect one cell at a time to produce a certain number of uh, protein. Uh, the, the problem with those, if, if the body has already immunity to the vector, it can blunt the response to the vaccine as a whole. So that's why the manufacturer tried to use vector that the human body had not been exposed to. So that's like gorilla adenovirus, chimpanzee adenovirus, or human adenovirus serotype 26. Uh, so the first one that I will talk about is the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine that uses the chimpanzee uh, adenovirus vector. So this phase one, two was performed in the UK and compared mostly a high um, single dose of CHAD vaccine to meningococcal vaccine. That was their comparator group. 
but only 10 subjects actually received a boost. But this boost, like meaning giving one vaccine followed another month by another shot, uh, was the one that moved to phase three trial. And you can see here, I mean, I list the ELISA title, I, I, I list the inoculization title, this is the TISA response. Uh, the vaccine was uh, well tolerated when prophylactic uh, uh, paracetamol was given. So at the end of the day, uh, 16 to 18 percent developed a fever. Uh, however, there was no serious adverse event, but that's quite remarkable to know. So the phase three trial started in England and India, as well as Brazil, South Africa, and the US. Uh, but uh, uh, roughly six weeks ago, it had stopped uh, because they wanted to investigate a volunteer who had developed a form of inflammation called transverse myelitis. Within a week, the trial had resumed everywhere but in the US. But as of last uh, Friday, uh, the FDA lifted the halt. Uh, uh, the informed consent is being changed to reflect uh, that uh, safety incidence. But the phase three trial uh, will uh, continue in the US as well. Um, so the Chinese company CanSino Biologic developed a vaccine based on adenovirus 5 in partnership with the um, Institute of Biology at the country Academy of Military Medical Science. The, the issue here is this prior exposure to AD5 in human can be common. So half of the subjects had high levels of pre-existing antibody, and actually those subjects had twice lower response compared to those that did not have prior exposure to adenovirus 5. Um, and then you can see perhaps the neutralizing titles are a little bit low, but again, it's really hard to make a comparison they were able to stimulate the TISA response in a video. Um, the, the, the nice thing about it is actually the vaccine was relatively uh, well tolerated. Uh, and actually the lower dose, uh, which is this one, uh, was chosen for the phase three trial uh, because it basically induced the same immunogenicity as the higher dose uh, with a better safety profile. So the efficacy trial is currently underway in Asia and Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, and Russia, and the vaccine is already approved in China. So another one is the Russian uh, vaccine. This is part of the Russian Ministry of Health that had started back in June, a phase one to, to two, and they called it the Sputnik V vaccine. It's a combination of two adenovirus uh, that's at five and at 26, uh, both engineered with the uh, spike. Uh, and then uh, basically what happens is uh, they they give the ad 26 first and then they boost five weeks later, three weeks later with the, with the ad 5. Uh, they tested different formulation uh, and the vaccine was well tolerated compared to other vaccine candidates. And then in August it had received conditional um, registration certificates and the phase three is underway and they're also enrolling uh, roughly 30,000 uh, participants. The next one that's also had been in the news uh, lately, it's the J&J &J vaccine. Uh, they started their phase uh, three trial last month, and that will include emory as a site. However, they also had to halt the study, but it had resumed with FDA blessing last Friday as well. Uh, here is the results of the phase one trial. You can see a higher um, reactogenicity, higher side effects that people are feeling with the higher dose. Uh, so that's why eventually they went with the lower dose, 5 to 10 to the 10 uh, viral uh, particle. Uh, the paper also showed the data on individuals 65 years and, and older, uh, and though numerically less than the younger adult, they still had a decent immune response, all within the range of the convalescent cancer. So other viral vector I want to mention uh, uh, briefly is uh, the Italian company Raitera. They use a adenovirus that infects gorilla. Uh, Vaxoc, this is a California-based uh, oral uh, cholera vaccine is made by Vaxar, and now they're working on an oral at five. Uh, the DZIF, it's in Germany, and they have an MVA vector, which had been really pioneered here at Emory with uh, Rama Amara. And then uh, Merck had different uh, uh, vectors. One of them is the measles vector, and one of them is the VSV that's used in the Ebola vaccine. Um, so the next platform is the protein subunit. So this platform is focusing on the virus spike protein or a key part of it. So for them to work, they do require adjuvants. So those are molecules that are able to stimulate uh, the immune response and they do need uh, multiple doses. You can also have uh, a protein-based vaccine called the virus-like protein 
which is basically a shell that mimics the coronavirus structure but doesn't have any uh, coronavirus materials uh, uh, inside. And they're able to stimulate a good immune response. A good example of that is Medicago that was in the news last week uh, as the Canadian government uh, had probably seen the results of the phase one data that had not been published and looks promising. Uh, so they have vouched to uh, buy millions of doses from, from that company. So one I want to mention is what published in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, last month, which is basically uh, the protein subunit vaccine, with or without the adjuvant. Here you can see actually really impressive neutralization titers uh, with the use of the adjuvant. They actually went ahead and used the lower dose, again, for uh, less uh, side effects. Uh, and then uh, uh, Emory will also be part of it at Grady for the phase three trial. There is currently a large phase three trial that's ongoing in South Africa. Any partnership between Novavax and the Serum Institute of India as well. Uh, I am serving as the co-chair for the Sanofi phase three trial. So this uh, vaccine is actually using insect cell. It's the same design as flu block, an approved vaccine for influenza. JSK will provide the, the adjuvant and the uh, the companies that actually completed enrollment for the phase one, two uh, last month, and they have completed all vaccination again last Friday, it seems like a big day for vaccine research. Um, they also plan to start the phase three trial in December, and they hope to have a safe and effective vaccine maybe by the mid of 2021. Um, so in addition to agreement that they have in the US, Canada, and Europe, Sanofi agreed to provide much of its global supply to COVAX, international collaboration to deliver the vaccine uh, in an equitable manner across the world. They have plans to make up to 1 billion doses in 2021. Um, so the last uh, platform I want to mention is the oldest trick in, in vaccine. So this is inactivated virus vaccine or attenuated vaccine. Um, and, uh, you know, just to make sure I'm, I'm not taking uh, uh, Mehun's uh, uh, Mehun's time. I just want to mention the study that was done by Sinovax, and there is another study done by Sinopharm, a vaccine that had been very well tolerated, and a phase three trial that are starting in Brazil, Turkey, Indonesia, the Emirates, Peru, Morocco, and Argentina. So, this, you know, this potentially could be uh, a one of the first vaccine that could be uh, licensed. Um, I'm here to show you uh, other uh, vaccine candidates using this platform. There is a particular collaboration that I would like to highlight between the Indian Council of Medical Research and the National Institute of Virology um, and uh, uh, Bharat uh, uh, Biotech uh, that designed a vaccine called uh, Covaxin, uh, and that's basically an inactivated form of the coronavirus. And then they add to it alum or another type of adjuvant that stimulates the TLR7, uh, TLR8. Uh, and then this vaccine has entered phase three trial as had been announced uh, uh, last week uh, by the company. And the question on everybody's mind is when do we expect a, a vaccine? And, and really, uh, I mean, you know, the reality is the journey to get a safe and effective vaccine is really, really long. So the fastest we have gone is, is the Ebola vaccine, which was done in five years. So though this is very much Operation World Speed, we have many months ahead. And where we are right now is just here because we really need to deal with the production and the distribution and then how would the vaccine be administered and what will be the impact in, in, in real life in phase four uh, trials and, and all the hurdles that we have to overcome to get there. Um, we also want to make sure uh, we are uh, uh, enrolling the right uh, population, those at the highest risk for infection and complication. So this is the Coronavirus Prevention Network that has hundreds of thousands of volunteers who have signed up from different backgrounds and community engagement is absolutely essential to the success of those uh, efficacy trials. Then the question will come, well, who will get the vaccine or rather the multiple vaccines that will be available when they become available? So everybody knows that at the beginning, the supply will be limited, but we will have a priority group such as the healthcare worker, essential worker, or individual like the older people or those with comorbidities that are at higher risk of morbidity and mortality. So the CDC put a plan in place in September. Um, and then um, um, again, I mean, I think it's just a matter of when the vaccine will be available, how many vaccines will be available, and what will be the vaccine hesitancy? Because you know what we know is they've done, um, you know, the media had done some uh, polling and then there were a lot of enthusiasm for the vaccine early in the pandemic. 
Right now, some people feel like perhaps it's rushed. I mean, I know it's rushed and it should be rushed, but at least the phase three trials are not rushed. The part that we're really examining the safety is, is, is really uh, done uh, well uh, in the world. Um, the work that we're doing is, is really not uh, possible in the challenging time without the unparalleled dedication of our staff uh, and then faculty and our volunteer. So um, I really want to thank all of them. Um, I want to highlight this fiction in particular that I like. This is end of March, uh, March 27, the first months where Atlanta experienced local transmission of COVID-19. And here at the Hope Clinic, uh, we were giving the first um, uh, phase uh, one vaccine of the mRNA. And we're also testing the antibody uh, of a passenger on the Diamond cruise ship. So this is a perfect blend of uh, acquired uh, and uh, natural immunity. So thank you so much. I'm, I'm more than happy to take any questions. I, uh, uh, I appreciate uh, the invitation. Thank you. Um, I just had a, a couple of questions. Um, I know there's talk now of like doing a a head-to-head -head kind of comparison of these all these different approaches and and putting them into you know a, a, a monkey challenge model. I don't know how the different companies are really on board with that because somebody's going to win, someone's going to lose, and now kind of everybody's winning. Um, but I think eventually we will get something like that because the NIH is going to want to see okay we need a study that, that runs J and J versus the uh, Moderna approach and, and really see which one has the best protective uh, capacity. And okay. two, um, I don't really hear much about mucosal immunity in, in any of these approaches. Uh, I think that's a, a way we, that it might eventually, I think we went in a safe route first to get something out there, but I, I think we really need something in the respiratory tract uh, and, and maybe CD8 and CD4 T cell immunity at higher levels than we maybe currently are getting from some of these. So just a few yeah. few ideas that I was thinking. Right. No, thank you. All of them are absolutely great uh, questions that you had, Chris. Uh, right. I think the priority perhaps for the upcoming year will not be to find, you know, again, which one won the race, which one got to the Operation Work Speed Gold Medal. I think really the priority right now is to have multiple vaccine candidates that are mm -hmm. safe and effective. Uh, most of them, other than the Johnson & Johnson, are actually a two-dose regimen. So for us to be able to vaccinate 7 billion people, we will need 14 billion doses, which is tremendous, and I don't think any company can do that. So yeah. I really think the, the, the goal is to, at least at, at first, is to have that. And, and you're right, and after that, we need to understand what will make a certain vaccine more advantageous. One point that you make, Chris, is a very important one. How can we get rid of the colonization of SARS-CoV-2, at least in the upper respiratory? Because that will be a way to really uh, impact the transmission. So it's, it will really decrease the burden of SARS-CoV-2 that's circulating in our community. So some believe that the protein vaccine platform with the adjuvant is able to induce a high enough level of neutralizing antibody, and perhaps the correct T cell. Again, I'm biased. I'm, I'm working on the Sanofi uh, um, um, uh, trial right now but with the hope that will actually uh, influence, similar to other protein vaccines, such as like the, the conjugate vaccine for haemophilus or meningitis or pneumococcus, will there be a high enough level that will get rid of the SARS-CoV-2 immune? All of the phase three trials are looking at symptomatic COVID-19, are looking at severe cases. But you're right, if we can move the needle a little bit more upfront and then avoiding acquisition, then we don't even have to worry about symptomatic, asymptomatic, severe, mild, or moderate. And Thank you. do we have any data coming in yet on the phase one Moderna uh, antibody? Uh, so the, those patients that got it in phase one, is, is it, we're at about six months out now. So I'm hoping that they're maintaining antibody levels at least somewhat. Yes, yes. I don't know how much I can say, but we did submit a letter to the editor next week, last week the New England Journal of Medicine, and Mahul had helped actually defining the antibody kinetics. All I can say, it does still look good, but um, unfortunately, I cannot share more than that. I understand. The, oh, that's good to hear. The letter will be peer, review, uh, peer reviewed soon, and then hopefully uh, we can share it with the larger scientific community. But it's an excellent point uh, you bring. Thank you. I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Mahul Sutar from uh, Assistant Professor from Memory Vaccine Center and the Department of Pediatrics. And uh, he will be speaking to us today on uh, the coronavirus biology and neutralization assays 
and vaccine approaches. So please take it away, Michael. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so this is, I think, the second time I'm presenting uh, to the summit. I think a couple of years ago, I presented some of the work that we've been doing uh, with Zika virus. And really, one of the themes in my lab uh, has been to study emerging uh, infectious uh, viruses. Uh, something that's been a passion of mine. Uh, mainly, uh, we've been focusing on mosquito-borne flaviviruses, uh, but more recently, uh, because of the facilities that my lab has that's very unique to Emory, uh, we were able to expand quite rapidly and be able to uh, immediately, uh, once the uh, uh, epidemic began, which turned into a pandemic in February, March, um, we began started working on several different aspects of this virus, uh, mainly focusing on some of the serological questions that are they were quite uh, important uh, back then. So my lab is located at the Emory Vaccine Center, which is at the Yerkes Primate Center, it's on the left. Uh, here we have a high containment uh, facility that allows us to be able to work uh, with highly infectious pathogens like uh, uh, Zika virus, West Nile virus, Dengue virus, as well as uh, uh, now SARS-CoV-2. Um, and this is, much of this work has been done in collaboration with one of my good friends, uh, Jens Rammert, who has his lab at the uh, uh, one of the Emory Children's Center uh, on campus at Emory University, uh, as well as we've been in very close uh, collaboration with the Hope Clinic and the uh, VTEU, uh, uh, led by both Evan Anderson and Nadine Rufail. Next slide. Next. All right, so coronaviruses, uh, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this because I think Nadine probably already went over uh, most of uh, this information, but these are large RNA viruses. Uh, one of the things that uh, became quite apparent when I was a graduate student, uh, I studied at University of North Carolina, very closely uh, friends with uh, Ralph Baer. One of the things that, um, that uh, uh, I learned very early on is that these coronaviruses have a pandemic potential, meaning that they can emerge from uh, uh, various different vertebrate species and jump species into humans and spread quite rapidly. We saw this with SARS-CoV-1, we saw this with MERS coronavirus, and to me it was only inevitable that we'd see this with another coronavirus uh, down the road, and unfortunately it's happened this past year. Next slide. So coronaviruses are beta coronaviruses. There's many different uh, hum there's a couple of different human related coronaviruses which we'll talk about in a second. But coronaviruses themselves obviously infect the respiratory tract. One of the hallmark aspects of this infection, the severity of the disease is really linked to the high levels of inflammation that are caused within the respiratory tract. This can be led through monocytic infiltration into the lungs, uh, infiltration of macrophages, as well as uh, neutrophils, uh, which leads to a cascade of inflammatory uh, disease, as well as high level virus replication which leads to destruction of the respiratory tract, uh, leading to uh, uh, lower respiratory rates and as well as uh, in some individuals uh, succumb to uh, death, of course. Next slide. So SARS-CoV-2 primarily infects and replicates uh, within the respiratory uh, epithelial cells. I'd like to show a couple of these slides because I think it really exemplifies where and how the virus replicates within the respiratory tract. So in the upper left uh, hand slide here, we have uh, an ultrastructural uh, electron microscopy image of, uh, uh, of a patient's uh, uh, lung tissue showing that the virus is replicating and infecting these uh, respiratory epithelials. Can you go to the next animation? And on the right side of uh, this animation that will pop up in a second. Yep. Oh, sorry, uh, I don't, I, I apologize, I thought I had um, uh, this updated slide, but essentially this virus seems to uh, infect the ciliated cells within the respiratory epithelium. And in the bottom left-hand panel here, the red marks that you see there are viral antigen staining of a patient's lung uh, sample, showing that the virus is infecting and replicating within these respiratory epithelials. One of the things that uh, became quite apparent, which was consistent with what was seen with SARS coronavirus, uh, the original one, is that one of the receptors for this virus is called ACE2. Uh, this receptor is found throughout the entire upper and lower respiratory tract, showing that the, the places and the targets that the virus can replicate in are present throughout the respiratory uh, epithelium. Next slide. 
And so we can model this in the laboratory as well quite easily. Uh, we can generate these uh, uh, air liquid interface cultures uh, that contain uh, several different respiratory uh, cells. It can contain goblet cells, basal cells, these ciliated cells, these non-ciliated cells. So essentially at the top, it's open to the air. The bottom is touching media. And these cells are able to grow and sort of polarize. And they look very similar to what's found in the respiratory tract. We can then take live virus, next slide. We can take the actual SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus, apply it to these cultures. Uh, next, please and be able to look at virus replication. So the way we do these experiments is we put on virus directly onto the top part where it says pseudostratified epithelium. And then we measure virus replication that's being secreted once these cells are infected. Uh, next uh, panel. And what we can also use in the laboratory are these special green looking viruses, uh, which we can use to track viral infection. Next, please. And what we can see is wherever the green is, that's where the virus is replicating. Uh, and this shows that the virus can clearly infect and replicate within these uh, respiratory epithelium uh, cells. Next slide. And so the, the name coronavirus comes from these spike-like projections that are present uh, on these uh, viral particles. Uh, the SARS-CoV-2 spike is what all vaccines, uh, most of them, 99% of them, are being uh, used to generate antibody responses to. Uh, the spike protein is very complex. Um, it has similarity to the original SARS coronavirus, but uh, in terms of the other human coronavirus, there's uh, little similarity. The spike protein is about 1,200 uh, amino acids in length. It really sticks out from the viral particle. And one of the most important uh, functional ends of this uh, spike protein is called the receptor binding domain. This is really where the, the viral protein binds this ACE2 receptor that's present in the respiratory epithelium, where then the virus can use to enter and infect a cell. This is really the area where most of these antibody responses are being targeted to. Next slide. And so we can see that this is present on the upper side uh, of this spike protein where that arrow is located. Uh, and this is where, uh, again, most of the antibody responses uh, will be generated towards, uh, that are neutralizing, that block the virus from infecting a slide. Next slide. And this just shows a comparison uh, between the different uh, alpha and beta coronaviruses. There's a total of uh, seven human coronaviruses that can infect humans. Uh, four of these are present endemically. Uh, this constitutes uh, things like uh, HKU1, OC43, NL63, 229E. Many of these viruses we probably never heard about before this pandemic. Uh, these are common circulating strains of coronavirus that uh, cause yearly infections of probably sniffles and flu and what have you, but most of the time we recover from these. Most of us have uh, antibodies to one, uh, if not many of these uh, human coronaviruses. The cross reactivity of our immune response from one coronavirus to the other is not well understood. And this is what many groups are now studying. Uh, but you can see that the percentages are very low in terms of the similarities between the spike protein. So what that means is that we naturally likely do not have a strong immune response to SARS-CoV-2. Next slide, please. And so one of the first goals that uh, my lab, as well as Jan Rammert's lab, uh, focused in on was to develop a, a rapid and highly specific serology test for SARS-CoV-2. Next, please. And one of the things that uh, Jens Rammert's lab immediately did was he was able to take a portion of this uh, virus, the receptor binding domain, this RBD protein that we talked about, that's a functional part of the spike protein that binds this ACE2 receptor. He was able to generate this in-house uh, he was able to make quite a bit of it, five milligrams of purified protein from about 120 mils of transfected uh, cell supining. Uh, he's also generating the full length spike protein as well as other structural proteins. And immediately back in March, he was able to generate an in-house uh, RBD-based ELISA. Next slide. Uh, this really allowed for rapid identification of uh, uh, an antibody test at Emory. 
Uh, so we, we immediately were able to start screening acute specimens uh, from patients that were infected uh, at the hospital to see how well and how robust uh, this assay was. Uh, and to be able to identify, accurately be able to identify uh, PCR confirmed uh, patients uh, really don't see much background signal, despite some of these individuals may have these endemic human coronaviruses. Uh, and that's shown in the middle slide. Uh, and then a positive control showing that this uh, ELISA works quite well. Next slide. And so we were able to parse out the various different isotypes and subtypes of antibodies that are present and how well they bind uh, this RBD protein, how well our immune system generates an antibody response to this RBD. Uh, we can see here on the left panel that there's an IgG response uh, as well as an IgM and to some degree an IgA response. And uh, that's highly diverse as well. Uh, so not all uh, acutely infected COVID-19 patients have the same level of antibody responses. What's quite uh, uh, interesting and uh, mostly expected was that most of the individuals seem to have high levels of IgG1 and IgG3 subtypes. This is typical uh, for a viral infection. Uh, next slide. And so this uh, RBD ELISA was then transferred over to the Emory University uh, Medical Laboratories, uh, headed by John Roback's uh, laboratory. Uh, John Roback's a professor of pathology. Uh, and his group was able to quickly uh, validate this assay uh, and was able to incorporate it into the hospital system uh, where they uh, received FDA uh, emergency use uh, approval. It's a highly specific, highly sensitive uh, RBD-based uh, serologic assay uh, that is able to accurately identify patients about five days uh, after PCR confirmation, we tend to see some very good uh, RBD-based uh, responses, uh, showing that this uh, work performs as well as that of a PCR confirmation. So it was able to really uh, improve on the diagnostic uh, aspect uh, of serology. Next slide. And so the next goal uh, that we wanted to, uh, in tandem, uh, really achieve was to address this question of neutralization. Next slide. Uh, so what is uh, neutralization? So neutralization uh, is the ability of these antibodies to block the ability of a virus to infect a target cell. It's one of the most important immunological assays for determining the immunity to viral infection and exposure uh, and vaccination. So Nadine talked about all these different vaccines that are being performed and I think Chris even mentioned, well, what about the standardization of these different uh, immune responses listed by these vaccines. One of the most critical aspects are the neutralization assay that's being performed uh, and being able to determine how potentially protective are these immune responses that are being elicited by either infection and preventing reinfection or from vaccination and preventing infection altogether. So the way we perform this in the laboratory is through a, a high throughput manner where we take either a patient's plasma or sera or a vaccinee's patient plasma or sera. We dilute this into 96 well plate format. We then combine that with live coronavirus. So this is the actual virus that's circulating uh, in nature. Uh, we then infect uh, viral cells and then we have various different readouts uh, that, we've been, uh, that we've developed over the last few months. Next slide, please. And so there's many different neutralization assays. If you start parsing through the literature, you'll see many different assays that people use. Each one of these has its own uh, pros and cons to them. One of the most tried and true uh, assays that people have used for many different viruses, including coronaviruses, is called a plaque reduction assay. The major problem with this assay, it's extremely low throughput, very labor intensive, uses up a ton of reagents and takes a very long time. But it's one of those assays that people have used time and time again. Uh, there's also these cytopathic effect-based assays uh, that uh, some vaccine uh, uh, platforms are using to help uh, understand their immunogenicity. Um, what, what we did in my lab was we developed uh, two different neutralization assays, and these are highlighted in the red here. One is a focus-forming uh, reduction neutralization assay, FRNT assay, and we developed an even faster and more uh, high throughput assay, which is called a FRNT MNG assay, which stands for M-neon green. This assay typically takes about a day to produce. Uh, 
to, to resolve in terms of identifying neutralization of a sample. Uh, and we're able to pr uh, process up to 200 samples per day. Uh, and I think over the past, gosh, I would say five months, we've probably processed well over uh, two to 3,000 samples. Um, so we've really uh, increased our throughput over the last few months. Next slide. And it's all happened in an incredibly fast pace. This is not something as usual in the world of science. These things typically take months to develop. Uh, so one of my uh, good friends and colleagues at the University of Texas the Medical Branch in Galveston, Pei Young Shi and Vineet Minachari, uh, had developed this uh, infectious clone derived virus. So one of the neat tricks that you can do with viruses is that you can put them on a DNA backbone and be able to uh, manipulate some of these viruses. Uh, and then be able to generate more of this virus. And one of the neat tricks that we can do in the laboratory is to replace one of uh, the accessory viral proteins, in other words, one that's not required for virus replication, and replace it with a gene or, or a sequence, uh, a viral, uh, uh, a sequence that's not normally found in viruses into this region called ORF7B. And when the virus translates it, uh, it makes this protein, the host translates it, the cell will light up green. So the next slide. And so we're able to use a virus like this in a reporter-based assay to more uh, 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 rapidly look at neutralization. So again, we take this virus, we mix it with our plasma one-to-one, -one, we put it onto viral cells, which are the platform that we use to be able to uh, evaluate neutralization. These cells express ACE2 receptor. Uh, what happens is you end up with these really neat looking green foci that you see in the, the, the circles here. Uh, we then count those green foci using uh, various different tools and softwares. And then we're able to look at the level of neutralization. So the next slide. And the next slide just has sort of an example of what one of these things look like. Uh, the slide's probably a little small for us to be able to see the individual wells. Uh, if you don't mind just clicking through the next two or three uh, uh, panels. Yep, and one more. There we go. And so what you can see here, oh, sorry, go back one. And so what you can see here is that we can take a patient sample uh, from the most concentrated, uh, which is the lowest dilution factor, down to the, the least concentrated going vertically downwards. You can see you'll start to increase the number of foci that are present. And this demonstrates that the serum that we're using is actually blocking the virus from infecting at a certain concentration. And if we look at a healthy control, we don't see that. Normally, we infect the virus with these cells for about 24 hours, and we see some really nice looking foci. But in this sort of exaggerated view, we let these cells go for 48 or 72 hours. You really uh, sort of see what these foci look like even afterwards. And no matter how long we let them go for, if your serum was able to, if this patient serum was able to neutralize the virus, we still didn't see any foci either. Next slide. And so one of the most important things, and this sort of gets at Chris's question of standardization and harmonization of many of these assays, is the need to perform concordance assays in a systematic manner to really look at the performance of these assays, to really understand where each of these assays fall in terms of their benchmarking. Next slide, please. There's many different assays, uh, again, that we talked about. Uh, our lab has mainly focused on the last two at the bottom. Next slide. And we've performed several different concordance tests to try to really understand where our assay falls relative to other groups' assays. And so one of the things that I'd like to highlight is this more recent study that we participated in, uh, led by the Duke Human Vaccine Institute, uh, led by Thomas Denny, uh, named it the SNACS uh, kit, uh, to be able to assess various different neutralization assays. Next slide. And the, so this involved uh, evaluating a, a approximately 54 different laboratories across the United States uh, and really looking at the performance of sensitivity, accuracy, and precision uh, at these various different assays. And one of the things that uh, was very exciting uh, when we got this report back was that our assay, this FRNT MNG assay, outperformed many of the other live virus assays out there. Uh, it was one of the best ranked uh, assays in terms of its precision, accuracy, and sensitivity. And this is the assay that we've been using uh, now in the laboratory for quite some time. Next slide. For many different samples and many different, and I'd like to sort of take you through some of the uh, uh, projects that we've been involved in using this particular uh, assay. 
So one of the things that we did early on, and this was published uh, back in May, is that we screened patient sera. How quickly do neutralizing antibody responses come up once a patient is infected with SARS-CoV-2? Here we see many of these patients, uh, I think 40 out of 44 patients, uh, induced neutralizing antibody responses uh, during the acute phase of infection. Next slide. Next slide, please. And here, uh, what we did was parsed out the data based on, uh, on the top set of panels days after symptom onset, and the bottom panel is days after positive PCR test, uh, nucleic acid test. On the left panel here is the RBD ELISA, and on the right side is the same set of samples, but a neutralization assay was performed on them. And one of the things that are very consistent uh, across these assays is that around day 10 to day 12 after symptom onset, patients start to accumulate these neutralizing antibody responses. And typically around day five after PCR confirmation, they start to accumulate an antibody response, which also corresponds to an induction of a neutralizing antibody response. Next slide. And so we put this data together and we looked at a correlation plot to ask, can the RBD ELISA serve as a, some sort of surrogate for neutralization uh, rather than performing what still is a labor intensive uh, BSL-3 high containment facility required assay? And the answer is yes. Um, you can use this RBD ELISA to really inform uh, how well the patient sample is going to neutralize uh, the virus. Uh, so here there's a very high and strong correlation between the RBD ELISA titers as well as viral neutralization. Next slide, please. And I'll just quickly take you through a four or five of these different things that we're now using this uh, FRNT neutralization assay to be able to parse out the various different elements of studying SARS-CoV-2. One of the things that we're doing with the Jens Ramerts lab here at uh, Emory University is we're screening And so uh, one of the things that we did was we were able to identify several monoclonal antibodies. Um, we screened about 50 monoclonal antibodies at the Jens Ramerts lab. We've been working with uh, uh, Andy McGuire's group at the Fred Hutch to really characterize one particular uh, uh, potently we were able to identify. Uh, and this particular antibody binds uh, what's called, again, the RBD. Sorry, can you go back one? There we go, it binds the RBD protein, which is in the pink, and the antibodies is in that turquoise blue purple color. They're able to identify this particular antibody uh, called CV30 that shows pretty high potency in terms of being able to block the virus. So we're working with his group and this work was recently published in Nature Communications uh, to really understand uh, how these antibodies accumulate uh, and can use multiple antibodies to help block this virus uh, from infecting cells. <clears throat> Next Sorry time. to interrupt you, Mahul. Uh, I've been notified we have about six minutes left in the session, so oh, okay, uh, we might want to wrap up quickly and, and then go to go to questions. And, and so, sure. You know. uh, so you can go to the the ICMR slide here. One of the things that we're working with um, is with folks in India, uh, Anmol Chandali and Murali Kishnakaja, who are at the Emory Vaccine Center at the uh, Institute, uh, the ICGEB. They've been working very closely uh, with ICMR to be able to characterize human patient samples. We're working very closely with their group. They're also generating human monoclonal antibodies from patients that are infected in India. Uh, and we're testing the neutralization assays uh, in my lab, which really allows a really nice uh, crosstalk between work that we do in my lab with uh, folks uh, in India, like Murali and Anmol. Next slide. Next slide, please. You can go to the next one. You can jump over this. You can, we also, you can skip over this as well. And so one of the things that we're also working with uh, is with various uh, entities uh, for vaccine development and testing. We're working very closely with Rama Mara's group, uh, who's developing an MVA-based uh, vaccine platform. We're working with the NIH uh, uh, Vaccine Research Center, in particular with Bob Cedar uh, and Joe Francisca, who's looking at uh, protein adjuvanted vaccines like Nadine spoke about. Next slide. 
our group has been working very closely with uh, Moderna and the NIH to be able to use our FRNT MNG based platform to be able to look at neutralization. So here's uh, a recent report that was published uh, in New England Journal of Medicine, which shows that this vaccine is quite efficacious across uh, the various different age ranges, whether it be patients that are uh, vaccinated in 18 to 55, 56 to 70, or greater than 71 years of age. We're able to use our assay across all of these different patient samples and show that the immune response is after the, uh, at, at the peak of the uh, vaccine response. Uh, really shows strong immunogenicity across all of these age ranges. Next slide. And so uh, this is just to quickly summarize uh, some of the things that I've shown you. Our lab is very interested in some of the serologic assays. We have a whole aspect of looking at the innate immune response to virus, as well as studying pathogenesis. There's many folks that have to be acknowledged. I'm not going to go through every single person, but I'll just mention a couple of names. Uh, folks in my laboratory, uh, Rienz Rammert's laboratory, Rafi Ahmed's laboratory, we're working very closely with them to look at the durability of these antibody responses. Uh, we are looking at uh, the Hope Clinic, uh, we're working very closely with the Hope Clinic uh, and the VTEU. And then there are funding sources from the NIH, as well as uh, uh, institutional support from uh, uh, Emory uh, leadership, COVID-19 cures, all of these other internal awards as well. So I'll, I'll cut myself short and uh, ask if anyone has any questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I just wanted to yeah. ask uh, one quick question, or actually a two-part question. I don't know if there was any data. I saw that there were some IgA responses in some of the, the patients. I was wondering if that had correlated with disease outcome at all, uh, if that was something that was yeah. that are or not? We're looking at that a little bit more closely. Some of the data that we collected very early on, it was very hastily put together because there was so much going on at the hospital with all these patients and a lot of the clinical data was not fully recorded well. Um, and so that's something that we have focused in on. I think other groups have sort of looked at the level of severity and the antibody response. And I think in general, the more severe patients seem to have higher antibody responses, which likely correlates with Right. greater viral loads. Um, and, and secondly, uh, so there's a lot of approaches that are full spike protein, uh, several are RBD, and it, I, I'm not sure right now which one is generating, they look like they're both generating sufficient neutralizing capacity, but, um, and maybe RBD could direct it, it could be higher initially, but I'm wondering if that's going to hold out kinetic wise with less CD4 epitopes to kind of keep those B cells uh, alive or, or plasma cells. So I'm just curious how that's going to play out. I don't, I don't... Yeah, fantastic questions. I think we're looking at patient samples, uh, looking at the durability of the immune response. Obviously, that's in the context of a viral infection. How the vaccine plays out, I think that's something that, as Nazine said, um, we'll, we'll have to wait and see how robust these immune responses will be and how important T cell responses will be. One of the things that I think is emerging um, is that there is an issue with antibody durability. I think we've known this from SARS-CoV-1. Uh, these antibody responses only lasted and waned uh, quite rapidly between 12 months to 24 months. Um, and I think there's conflicting yet, I wanna say decent studies saying that durability may be an issue uh, with you know, after one has resolved infection, how robust are those immune responses six months, 12 months later? All I can say is that, you know, uh, we are fortunate to have uh, doctors and scientists like Nadine and Mayo who are trying to uh, create a line of defense uh, for COVID-19 and all the other viruses we face from time to time. And, you know, it's all like a, a sci-fi movie uh, for most of us here, you know, Chris? Uh, you know, we, we really appreciate uh, how, uh, you know, and we, I clearly know that it is quite uh, challenging for them to be participating in a program like that. But Dr. Rafi Ahmed and Emory Vaccine Center has worked with us in the past and we just want to show people what you guys are doing. John, you, would you like to comment, sir? It shows how quickly research is moving, but the uh, rather, the required methodical pace at which it should take place, the, acc the accretion, the accumulation of knowledge, and trying to distill it into some cl clinical proposals 
that can be scaled up to really uh, address uh, the general population. Of course, uh, the question that is on the tip of everybody is, uh, in your opinion, when do you think there will be a vaccine available? One of the vaccines available to the general population in the United States? And I fully realize that if you don't wish to answer the question, that's okay too. <clears throat> I don't, I don't know if Nadine is on, and if she's not, I can answer this question uh, in her place. Yeah, go ahead, Mahul. It's like a crystal ball. I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a crystal ball, and I think um, some of the efficacy data will, I believe, from what I understood, it will come out in early December on some of these vaccines. It's how well, what kind of protection uh, will be observed with these vaccines, and then how quickly they can be scaled up and deployed in, in a very systematic and very rapid manner, especially to the frontline uh, workers. Right. Yeah, I completely agree with you, Mehul. I think there will be a lag between when a vaccine is approved. And I think the only approval we're looking at right now is emergency use authorization. And then the time where the vaccine is available for the general public. So I really think there might be many months lag between those two events. Thank I had you. one question for Unity. Um, so when looking at the mRNA-based vaccines, they require most of them minus 80 storage. So the cold chain uh, transportation is gonna be an issue with that, especially in the, in the developing world, even in the US and the rural areas. You may not have access to uh, minus 80 uh, freezers, ultra low freezers everywhere. So um, how do you think we're gonna to deal with that? Just ship it on dry ice and, and, and use it as quickly as possible or? Yeah, no, that's a great question, Chris. I think there is um, a lot um, that we need to plan for production and distribution of the vaccine. And as you mentioned, the logistics of the, of the cold chains uh, are not something to take uh, lightly. Uh, I mean, even in, in a country such as the U.S., uh, this will remain a big challenge. I know, for example, here at Emory, recently that they did uh, buy a specific freezer to be able to store the vaccine. Perhaps that's a luxury that a big metropolitan city such as Atlanta can have with a large uh, healthcare. But it's not a given for uh, rural areas. It's definitely not a given uh, for countries as part of Africa, et cetera. So they will be other types of vaccine that perhaps will be more like the influenza shot when it's stored at two to eight degrees, which still is cold chain, but nonetheless a little bit more manageable. I have worked with the Georgia Tech manufacturer on a Microneedle patch. This one actually is quite thermostable because it comes in a dry form. You know, it's, it's a little bit futuristic, but could we think of a vaccine that does not require cold chain, has a small footprint, does not have a uh, sharp waste, uh, uh, and then can be taken uh, as self administration where you don't really need to go into somebody's office, get exposed potentially to coronavirus to receive a vaccine. So there are many things that need to be dealt with as far as the production. Uh, the delivery and the administration. Thank you. Good point. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Nadine uh, and Mehul. We really appreciate it, uh, your participation and support for this event. Uh, wish you all the best and Godspeed. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Grateful. Thank you both, Mehul and Nadine, wonderful presentations. Thank you. Thank you.